So, Bob, I'm delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming and sharing your wisdom with our community today. So I'm going to turn it over to you and stop sharing. Thank you, Jamie. And thanks for the invitation. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay, and let me start my timer. All right. Hey, everyone. Glad to be here. I want to dive in. I have some, uh, I think, an important message that I'd like to share with everyone. So it's I've, I've changed the title, I think, to what I, I sent to Jamie. It's an Agile Coach's Guide to Confirming Your Value. So instead of communicating your value, instead of uh, demonstrating your value, the, the, the idea, the first idea I want to present to you is confirming your value. And how do you confirm it? You look your stakeholder, whoever's paying your paycheck, whoever is who, whoever you're coaching for or working for as a scrum master, you periodically look them in the eye and you ask them, "Am I what what value am I producing, and how can I produce more value?" And you realign with them. So it's not so much showing or look at the data or look at Jira. All of those are nice things and presentations, but it's looking people in the eye and then having that discussion around value. So you're confirming that I am, I'm delivering the value to you as my client. All right. So that's the first, I think, important idea. The challenge is I think, at least from my point of view, uh, agile coaching is sort of one of the hardest, probably in, one of the, in my mind, one of the top five hardest jobs on the planet earth. And that, and that would include Scrum Masters, et cetera. So anyone who's coaching, it's a tough job. So you're sort of in the eye of the hurricane. Uh, the context, it's a challenge. Uh, there's no easy answer to value. Uh, I hope all of you grab a piece of paper, either electronic or physical. I prefer physical with a writing utensil and and jot down some notes. And what I want you to do is create your your value notes for your context out of what you're hearing today. Ideas. Oh, I need to I need to do a better job of this. And so create your value, your your incremental value <laughs> proposition or strategy uh, as a result of that. Uh, the, this next idea I want to present is this notion of it's part of the challenge is no matter what it, Jerry Weinberg is no longer with us, but he, he was just a powerhouse author and, and very wise in software development over 50 years. And he, he uh, I think in his uh, consulting books, Secrets of Consulting, he talked about no matter how it looks at first, it's always a people problem. Uh, so no matter how technical the problem, even an architect putting designs and things together, you're not doing that algorithmically. You're doing it with people. People with egos, people with ideas, people who aren't sharing their ideas, et cetera. So technologists, we navigate process, frameworks, all architecture, metrics, and that's all good. That's one side of our brain. But the other side of our brain as a coach is remembering that everything, we're in human systems. We're in human dynamic systems. Uh, so that's part of the challenge. And I would say lean into, you know, be aware of the challenge that you have. You're navigating things. And don't get caught up in too much in technology. I think a lot of times today, folks are, a lot of coaches are discussing with me, at least, they're talking about getting involved in the teams technically. You know, I'll exaggerate writing code or whatever. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. But I would say, sharpen up your skills with human dynamics might, might increase your value more. Uh, soft skills, things like that uh, is what I'm talking about. The third part of the challenge is managing perceptions. I want you all to blow up that screen. I hope you can see it enough. There's that word cloud. Uh, at the Agile Conference in 2023 in Orlando, uh, a, a, a friend shared this with me. I didn't attend this session, but when he shared it with me, he said this word cloud came out of a group that was attending a session, and this was their impression of people who were doing Agile coaching. So this this was, when you think about Agile coaches, what do you think about? Maybe there was a little bit of negativity in the in the initial question, right? Like, what are some of the challenges from your Agile coaches? And I would include Scrum Masters in this. So when I say coaches, it's really, you know, Scrum Masters to me are coaches. And we all have coaching skills. So I want you to look at that and, and are, you know, what are some of your challenges with Agile coaches was the question. And then are you surprised by the reactions 
there. So everyone scan that word cloud. You may even want to take a screenshot of it if you can. So I'll let that I'll let that sit with you a little bit. The things that I things that I uh, resonate with, I'm just looking now. Like, hey, change. Here we are, a change agent, and our customers are telling us that our, <laughs> the coaches are not are not friendly to change. Uh, we're uh, taught we're <laughs> we lack flexibility. Uh, we have attitude. We're stubborn. We have big egos. Uh, clearly, big egos. Are, uh, how many times that came? We're closed minded. Uh, so I think part of the challenge is how are we showing up to the people who are determining our value? Is everyone with me? Be be aware of how we're showing up, and I think this is a, this is a call to arms. We may not be showing up the way uh, the way we intend to be, or we're not being perceived that way. We have some work to do. So no, enough of that. Setting the stage. That's the challenge scape. Uh, the first thing I want to, maybe the first big idea I want to get across to all of you, value. The best time to negotiate or establish your value proposition or how do you deliver value is in the beginning of an engagement. So if you're a scrum master and assigned to a team, that's the beginning of an engagement. If you're a coach meeting someone to coach them, the first time you're coaching them, a group, a team, an organization, a set of leaders, whatever, the, the best that you have an opportunity at the beginning to set the stage, to introduce yourself. Think of yourself as negotiating a contract, even if you're not contractual, even if you're an internal employee, you're establishing rules of engagement. It's a wonderful place to explain what agile coaching is and what it isn't. Does that resonate with all of you? I, I find that a lot of folks don't know what we do. That's the part, that's one of the, the initial disconnects of value. How can I determine if someone's doing delivering me value if I don't really know what they do? Uh, so I think it's our job to establish that. Uh, I like using the Agile Coaching Growth Wheel. I'll, exp I'll show you that later as a way of explaining, this is what Agile Coaching is, and this is what it isn't. And this is what I do, and this is what I don't do. Not not in a controversial way, but in you're you're explaining that so that you can navigate that journey. Uh, the other part of the beginning is establishing your clients' goals, not your goals, the clients' goals in their language. What are why why are they asking you to coach? What are they trying to achieve? What outcomes are they looking for? And be clear and drill into that. And don't convert it in your head. A mistake that a, a lot of Agile coaches make is the client will talk to us about an objective and we'll convert it into Agile ease. Oh, we need to reduce whip limit. Oh, we need to install Scrum. Oh, we need to do this in order to deliver it. No, we, yes, we may use those tactics, but we don't want to lose sight of the client's wording, the client's goals, the client's vision. Whoever we're, whoever we're serving, we want to be very clear. Another important part of the beginning is to co-create things. So if I asked Joe Scherler and I said, Joe, I want you to coach teams. There's eight, there's 18 scrum teams. I want you to coach them and you have three sprints to get them to high performance. That would be, that would be an opportunity for Joe to say, that's, that's an outstanding request, Bob, but what can we do together? <laughs> right? How can we co-create those outcomes together? Because guess what? All those people report to you and you have influence and you're setting the landscape for me. So what can we do of you telling me and delegating to me? What can we do to partner? What can we do to co-create outcomes? What can we do to create that shared landscape as, as a coach and a client? Whether you're talking to a leader or a scrum team, it's the same thing. What can we do to co-create the outcomes we're envisioning? And the more co-creation you can do in the beginning, I think the better the outcomes, the better the understanding, the, the better the value understanding is. So don't waste your beginnings. Oh, I'm reading someone's mind, Wayne Marcy's. I'm reading Wayne Marcy's mind. And Wayne, Wayne is like, well, what if, I, what if I blow it in the beginning? Is it too late? Is it too late? And I'm like, no, Wayne, right? If you blew it, you didn't establish a good a good beginning. You can always re-beginning. You could always reset in the middle. Now, don't do not don't do that lazily. It's best to do it right at the beginning of an engagement. But if you don't have clear alignment, you can realign in the middle. You can realignment, uh, realign two thirds away. Just say, stop. I think, I think we may be out of alignment, right? Expectations. I want to recheck the value proposition. Am I really delivering it? So you you can do it periodically along the way. And if you didn't do it, please do it. Beginnings. Don't waste your beginnings. 
don't waste your setups, right? That's an important thing, that contract, if you will. This is what I talk about. The Agile Coaching Growth Wheel, I use it in that phase. I, I use it as a primer. I use it to explain what coaching is and isn't. Usually when I'm, when I'm ent entering a coaching system, with a relationship with a team, an organization, I'll try to do a mini session using the wheel to explain what agile coaching is, what the stances are, to share terminology lightly, very lightly. It's a very light 10 to 15 minute primer, but it gives me the ability to, to use that to, to manage expectations, to manage value direction, and it also gives me a language that I can refer to back with the client. I, I often switch stances with them. And now that they know what I'm doing and they have they have terminology for it, it helps us to work together to actually, instead of me coaching the client, we're dancing in our coaching together. So it's a what it's, it's part of that beginning that I think you can use it very lightly, very lightly. Don't do a two hour class or something like that. It's a very light sort of touch. So that's that's another set of ideas to consider. Now what I want to do is I want to talk about when I was envisioning this talk, the inspiration for this talk was about maybe 12 to 18 months ago when I saw a lot of layoffs going on. And unfortunately, it's still there's a lot of turbulence in our in our industry. Uh, it's driven from economics, the overall economy, but it's also driven, I think, internally by not understanding value. And so the genesis of this talk was you know, maybe I, I was thinking to myself, maybe we haven't been doing a good, maybe we're part of the problem in that we're not showing, we're not, and we're not confirming our value uh, to folks. And, and so when I was doing some research, I went out and I, I said, well, what, what's, what are the ideas out in the network that people have talked about coaching value? And there wasn't a lot of articles. There were some, and I captured the ones at the time that made sense, that that resonated with me. And I want to share those. I want to share a synopsis of those authors, but you can go and read the articles later on for more details. So there were seven perspectives, uh, different perspectives on value. Coaches, agile coaches, Scrum Master, remember, Scrum Masters too, right? We, agilists. I don't, I don't know if any Agilist has been really doing a great job of, of sort of confirming their value. So Pierre Nyes, I think that's the way to pronounce his name. He talks about coaching. In th the, the big idea that he talked about was coaching in 360 degrees of not being unidirectional. Even if you're a scrum master, very often a scrum master looks at their coaching responsibility as downward to the team. Does that resonate with everyone? It's a downward team direction. And what, what Pierre was saying is that's great. But you know what? You you may want to change your vision and look up and coach up occasionally, if you can, if you have the skill for it, if you have the courage for it, and and you may want to coach laterally. And he was talking about don't don't be too myopic. For example, many scrum teams, most of their impediments are not teamward; they're outward. If that makes sense to everyone. So if if you as a coach are not looking outward, if you're just focusing downward, you may be missing part of your value proposition. You may be missing part of your visibility in the organization. So Pierre's big idea was think about 360, have an organizational 360. And the Scrum role talks about that, but is actually doing something about it, is is the point. Len Lagesty, I think Len is a coach on the West Coast. He talked about the idea of coaching for impact. One of the things that really resonates with me is he said, how, measure how many proud parent moments you're having as a coach. Uh, and if you're having zero, that's probably not good. So you want to be, yeah, any, everyone here, anyone here who's a parent, you know what I mean by a proud parent moment, right? My 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 oldest child graduates from Harvard, or I'm so, or something, and I'm crying as, as they graduate. It's a proud parent moment. Or a small child, ride their bike. I remember when my kids rode their bike independently the first time. That was a proud parent moment. Or the first time my son got smashed to the ground on a football field. On <laughs> it was a no, it wasn't. I'm making this stuff up. A coaching tree. Are you creating your succession plan? Are you creating coaches around you? 
who can who can replace you basically and then quality i love what len we've lost our focus organizationally i think in the early days of agile and i was around unfortunately in the early days there was more talk about building quality building quality in and i don't know if we talk about quality enough today and so he was reminding maybe we become a champion as a coach of quality jesse fuel is a coach in dc and this is another idea that I use. Jesse talks about the best determination of your value is surveying the people that you're coaching. So put together an informal survey, a Google, a Google form or whatever. You can make it anonymous or not and put a net promoter score together and ask some discrete questions to talk about your value and then get that value. And that's determining your value from the people that you are directly coaching whether that's teams and or individuals. And then take, and depending on how you structure it, get some fine-tuned data, like how what could I do to improve and then start improving that? Or what, am, I, am I hitting the mark on value or have I missed it? Am I being too agile-centric and I'm missing organizational value? And, and then adjust to that. And, and I, I getting, getting client feedback. Uh, you could get it face to face as well. Remember, I talked about face to face. So I, I wouldn't just rely on a survey. Todd Lankford talks about outcomes. Everyone's talking about outcomes, but he he, he emphasizes things like waste. Right? Are we reducing waste or relearning? Are we unlearning to relearn? Is the coach actually unlearning, the, helping the team to to jettison things, practices that are not working, and then relearning some new or experimenting with new practices? And then having a bias towards action. I love that. A bias towards getting in the game. A bias towards a bias towards moving from talking about it to getting things done and, and making that very visible. Neil McShane talks about focusing on performance metrics, like getting jobs done, client experience, things like that. Gene Gendo is a coach in New York, very less oriented, large scale scrum oriented in his focus. And you can see that in culture leadership. And he talked about organizational optimization, optimization. What are we doing to, to help from an organizational or from a reframe, right? Think of Lulu, like the, the Lou culture models. And are we moving, are we moving the culture or how, and how are we helping to move the culture? And then Roger Brown talks about reasons to hire. Uh, this is the oldest article. It was around 2009, but I just, I, Roger is one of the earliest CECs with the Scrum Alliance, and he's just a venerable coach. And I, I just love listening to him. Uh, and he talked about deep experience, coaching competencies, perspective. So measuring the measuring a coach based on their value, based on their background, and maybe hiring decisions. So there's an eclectic mix of perspectives. I personally like the things, like I said, the NPS surveys warm my heart. Proud parent moments are something that I try to track in my journaling. Uh, 360 coaching to me is systemic coaching is something. And I try to I try to really sort of think about, am I being systemic enough? Because I think the value is broader. But really, my value proposition is is different. So mine, mine is like an eighth an eighth set of ideas, and I call it retention equivalency. So I don't know if any of you, I've been a senior leader in organizations who've discussed layoffs. It's, it's, we talk about, are we either going to lay people off or are we going to add people? It's the same discussions. Leaders get into a room and they're talking about how to invest. Where do we invest in people? What roles do we invest in? And I don't know if any of you have heard it, but I, I call them producers. There's people in organizations that are perceived, their, their value is inherent. Uh, developers are inherent value. If you cut a developer, you think I'm doing less. Does that make sense to everyone? And if I add developers, I'm doing, I have more capability to do product development. So from a leader's point of view, developers have this inherent value. And there's other roles there, like front-end developers, back-ends, architects, data engineers, DevOps engineers. Typically, from a leadership perspective, they have inherent value. Doesn't mean you don't cut them, but you, you realize that it undercuts it undercuts your ROI. It undercuts your, your earning. It undercuts your product development stream, your value stream. Then there's another set of roles Anyone ever hear the term overhead? I don't know if you've ever heard the term. Oh, there's overhead roles. 
Uh, an example of that is managers. Very often in organizations, management, believe it or not, are considered overhead. Uh, so, uh, and and other project managers are often considered overhead. Uh, uh, manual testers are often considered overhead. Uh, and and I hate to break the news, but in in most organizations, agile roles are considered overhead. That doesn't mean they don't have value. It just means that the leaders don't really understand the value as it's not equivalent to the developers. It's not that it's not that inherent value. It's a question. What are, what am I getting out of these folks? So scrum roles, uh, safe roles, coaching roles are that. And and so my point in value is how do we cross that chasm back? Everyone with me? How do we cross the chasm from being overhead to being a producer? And in some organizations, they look at agile roles as being on that that value, that inherent value side, but not in enough organizations. So to me, that's that that's the imperative. How do we how do we move across? So sure. so my overall, I'll stop for a second, it, it, but I want to just hit this slide, and then I'll see if anyone, sure. if there's a few questions, or someone is interrupting so uh my value advice then is establish that remember that up front the beginning is important uh you need to connect to the business don't connect to agile don't don't use agile gobbledygook as as your reason for being we need to connect to the outcomes from our stakeholders and then partner with them and co-create to their agenda not our agenda let, and, and connect the dots to agile ways of, of delivering to that. Focus, f consider qualitative and quantitative measures. Don't just look at JIRA. Don't, don't tell everyone, well, my value is in JIRA. My team over the last year increased their velocity by 13 points or 52%. Therefore, I have value. Just look at JIRA. That is a terrible way to communicate your, your value. Uh, I mean, most leaders aren't even looking at JIRA, or they might periodically look at it. So the data tells part of the story, but there's another part of the story that you you have to communicate that. You have to gain visibility, and that's where we're going. The one coaching metric that matters then, am I adding self-evident value equivalent to the producers? And have I personally confirmed that value with my, with my shareholders by looking them in the eye, either virtual eyes or physical eyes? Yeah, is so what I is it, is I what you, what I want you to think yeah. about? I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, we might take a let me look at the time. What I'll do is maybe just run through a few more slides and then go to the end and see if there's any Q and A time. Okay, everyone. All right, so there's some important topics I want to. So when I was presenting these slides, I presented these slides back like whenever I originated them to a group of coaches I mentor. And when I presented this slide, everyone looked at me like I had been, I, I think like taken over by the devil or something like that. And they're like, what are you talking about? Stop being so humble. Stop being so servant oriented, right? But you're, you're a coach. And what are you telling me? And what I'm telling you is I think we've skewed to, to the right too far. I think we're too humble. Most, not all of you, I'm not steer, but many of us are too quiet as coaches, as scrum masters. We're on the sidelines. We're on the periphery. We're not talking about ourselves. And we're not blowing your own horn. You're not, you're not making your personal contributions. Very often, we actually stand back and say, look at the team. Look what we've accomplished with the team. That's fantastic. What part did you play? You played a part. Talk about the part you played. Be selfish for a little bit. Be self-centered for a little bit. Now, whenever I present this slide, someone comes off and says, but Bob, are you giving us permission to be an ass? Like an obnoxious ass or someone, you know, sort of an e And I'm not, no, that's not the point. But I, I think rarely is that the case. So if you are talking about yourself all the time, you need to meet her back to the middle. But that's that's not most coaches to me. Most coaches are are very servant oriented and are behind the scenes. And you need to rotate back in, create and market. Think of creating your personal brand. I want you to connect personal branding to this. So stop being so up. So advocate for yourself, and don't think the data speaks for itself. Everyone with me, 
Don't just point at Jira or a data or a dashboard and say, my value proposition is there. That's great. Let it there. But also talk about your value proposition in other terms, in business impact terms, in outcomes that you negotiated with your stakeholders in the beginning where you co-created and co-owned those things. Don't expect your team to speak for you. It's wonderful if they do. If they love you, that's fantastic. But you have to speak for yourself. You can't just sit in the corner and say, well, everyone's re- everyone's emanating my value proposition. That's a, that's a bad strategy. You have to do that yourself. Your boss isn't your value advocate. They, they could be doing it as well. I remember what I was, I was talking to some people from Capital One. Capital One is a famous or an infamous is an example maybe a year ago of layoffs. Capital One laid off like 1,500 agile roles. And I was talking to some leaders about what were some of the dynamics of that. And ec- economics were part of it. But, but from a value proposition at Capital One, most people were looking at their bosses to be their advocate. Does that make sense to everyone? And so everyone was like, oh, my advocate is my boss. And then the boss was like, that's, they're my boss and their boss. So out of 1,500 people, there was one person that was advocating for Agile and explaining the value proposition. Imagine that uh, I, and how, how well they're doing that. And, and so, and everyone was not taking their own personal responsibility. And I think that was a piece of the decision-making there. Imagine a world where 1,500 raging Passionate agilists were were communicating value propositions and navigating it and negotiating it with their clients. I think that might have disrupted that outcome. So don't expect someone else to do it. You have to advocate for yourself. Everyone with me, write that. To, yeah, take personal responsibility to do that. Uh, relentlessly. Now, part of part of value is you have to have the chops. You have to have the skills. You have to deliver the goods. So become well-rounded. The Agile Coaching Growth Wheel is a wonderful metaphor for growing your your Agile skills. Not in a role. Forget your role. It could be agile, coaching skills for a product owner. It could be coaching skills for a manager. So become more T-shaped or more pie-shaped. Relentlessly do that over time. You have to. That's part of your value proposition. You can't be static. And remember that. Remember that word cloud earlier? I would argue many coaches are too ego driven and they think they think they've arrived. I, I hate to challenge you, but you're never done honing your agile coaching skills. Right? You're never you're never good enough. You're never done. Don't 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 get complacent. Another part of value is getting skin in the game. There's there's a sad picture I saw years ago where someone put together a graphic that said scrum masters don't do these things. They don't get coffee for the team. They don't get pastries for the team. They don't take notes for the team. They don't administrate the team. And all of this was true because it, at the time, I guess a lot of scrum masters were becoming like administrative assistants for the team, or that was the mindset. And the idea was to pull back Everyone with me, pull back from the team and to facilitate, but not to really do things for the team. It's the team's responsibility to do the work. And I'm just coaching and facility. And I'm challenging that a little bit. And the little bit is you need to find some skin in the game. So you can say, I played a direct part in that outcome, right? If you're coaching leaders, maybe you co-create some strategies, some agile strategies with them. You help them. Do you directly skid in the game when they're prioritizing items, epics for value streams? You're you're helping directly. You're having opinions. You're stepping in from an outside role into an inside role. Partnership, co-creation, ideation, evangelism, ownership. You have ownership for an outcome. Now, there's a balancing act here. A lot of folks challenge me. It's like, but Bob, we're we're not supposed to totally be contributors. And you're absolutely right. But I think 0% skin in the game is a no-win situation. Everyone with me? 0% is not the right percentage. And you have to find, you have to find, depending on the role, if you're coaching a team, you have to find a place to have skin in the game. 
If I'm coaching product owners, there's a different place. If I'm coaching leaders, there's a different place. So it's very situational. But but really challenge yourself to say, am I connected? Am I directly connected to a business outcome in some way? Skin in the game. Another important thing is to increase your visibility. I, I think co coaching skills, I'll pick on facilitation skills. Probably all of you are wonderful. For anyone coming to this session are rock star facilitators, right? And and within your teams. And so so what I'm what I'm saying is, why don't you do that organizationally? Volunteer, get out in the organization. If the leadership team is having a a strategy session, right? All of you, I'm going to Slava, pick, raise your hand and say, I want to get in the game, right? I can help facilitate that session, even if it's risky and gain visibility or if there's a team building event going on or if there's a community of practice starting up raise your hand get in the, get in the game start start moving beyond the purview of your direct coaching and i know it's going to take some extra time and it's going to be balancing and you don't want to exceed too much whip but at the same time so remember that personal branding point i made Here's here's a, probably a terrible brand, Bob Galen. So what do you think of Bob Galen? Oh, Bob Galen, Bob Galen, agile coach over there. Uh, nice guy. He he does dad jokes every once in a while, and he has a nice white beard. Uh, what else? An agile coach. He does agile coaching for us. So that's my personal brand. Really powerful, right? Uh, if we have budget constraints, we're going to keep the guy because of his white beard. No. I want a personal brand. I want to. I want to reframe that personal brand. I want folks to, see, you know, to talk about the business. Bob Galen, my gosh, do you realize what he did from an outcome perspective on Project Zebra? He did a one. He played a wonderful job in in actually orchestrating those teams and focusing them and working with product development and even with the leadership team to help form that and deliver that. And, and his facilitation skills are terrible. No, his facilitation skills are great. So now the, now I'm starting to, to, my brand is becoming much more expansive. They've, and they have examples of what I've done. Oh, Bob, we don't even know what the other side, what team does he work on? Well, what we don't know. All right. Personal branding is important. So look for visibility. Your, your visibility matters. I'm trying to balance time. Finding allies. I'll actually go here uh, to the next slide. I grabbed this from LinkedIn. I don't know Elena, uh, but I just, I saw this on LinkedIn and I just, I stole it, this idea, because I think it resonates with me. It's a little bit of a different perspective and I'll bring it back to, to coaching value. She, she was talking, she's talking about building alliances and how important it is to build alliances in companies. Whether you're an internal employee or an outside, it doesn't matter. And she talked about, I'll just read it quickly because it makes me happy. Uh, step one, no matter what level you are, is to create a map of the people you need to support you. Then write down their motivations, what influences them and who they have strong connections within the organization. That's step one, to really understand their motivations, their whys, uh, the outcomes they're looking for. Ultimately, this is about identifying who you need to be in your alliance, as well as who might have the power to hold you back. So here are my supporters and here are my detractors. And what is my what is my landscape? Once you've mapped this out, then you build your strategy of connection and influence. Now you start reconnecting, you start hardening, you start strengthening those alliances. These are people that are advocating for you when you're not in the room. Everyone with me? This is you're building folks who know what you do, they know what your brand is, they know what your value proposition is, and they're fighting for you out there when the opportunities arise. You're not even in the room. Or you may not even be working that day, and you're building those alliances. This is not an intuitive task for many. So if you have a trusted work friend, sit down and help each other unravel what's happening in your organization. Now, Elena's context, she was talking about getting promoted. Everyone with me? She was building alliances to get promoted. But I'm going to flip it back and say building alliances to accentuate your value, to understand and communicate and to accentuate your value. 
your alliance team. It's the same thing. And it's incredibly important. Katiana is a, is a coach and uh, her boss came out. She was just talking to me. I'm making this up, everyone. But she was talking, her boss was talking to her and talked about how great a job she did with Team uh, team Boomerang. And and here was the decision. Tatiana, you just did a fantastic job with Team Boomerang. They knocked it out of the park. Oh, my God, I'm so happy with you. Uh, thank you. And that's a wonderful kudo, isn't it, everyone? Wonderful, makes me warm, makes me snuggly. But I don't have any detail in it. It's an art. It's sort of a high level, superficial kudo. And I think there's a lot of superficial kudos going on in the world. And they're wonderful. Embrace them. But then use them as an avenue to do to do what? To dig deeper. Your responsibility is to dig deeper to get what am I doing well so that I can do more of that. And then dig into that kudo and say, fantastic, thank you for that. But what could I have done to do better? And what can I do to pivot on value proposition? Did I miss the value proposition, your goals at, at all? And what can I do to even accentuate to your goals? Tell me more. How do I pivot? What adjustments can I make? It, it, you want to bring that in. You want to dive deeper into that value. Because I think that's super, it doesn't give you enough context. It actually can make you complacent because you don't realize you have more work to do to connect the dots on your value. So it's not a confrontation. It's a curiosity aspect. Dig into it. Figure out more. Spend some time. Love that. What did I do? What specifically did I do well? What specifically do I need to work on? What's the one thing that I need to work on? Back to branding. Jeff Bezos, I love this quote. He talks, branding is personal branding, is what people say about you when you're not in the room. I want you all after this session, please do this. Please, sometime today, tomorrow, get quietly in a room and say, what are people, what brand have I emitted so far? What valuation have I emitted so far? What do people, how do they characterize me when I'm not in the room? And I know you don't know, but imagine, imagine I characterize myself or a Bob coach, white beard. That wasn't a very powerful brand. So what are they saying about you? And then ask yourself, is that what you want them to be saying about you? And if there's a gap, I want you to start closing that gap. Maybe you need to start telling people that you're working in the community. Talk to talk to them about a book you read. Talk to make, volunteer for something. Start shifting the perception of you, the brand of you, so that it connects more to value. But what are they saying about you in that room? And and very often, I think we're 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 if we're not doing a good enough job of emanation, we're not. There's not a very compelling story. And you, I want you to increase the, comp the compelling nature, the value nature of your story. This is the last slide, and then we have a few minutes for questions, if, if there are any. And I'll let, it, I'll let it to Jamie and Mark or whoever to facilitate that. But uh, final slide, future value. It, this goes back to Weinberg, and I had to I had to bring in AI into value, if that makes sense, everyone, because right now I think we're also AI is starting to disrupt us, or there's the fear of AI disrupting us. We will have, no longer have coaches or scrum masters. They will there will be AIs that will replace us, and so every problem is a human problem. Remember that Weinberg. I think AI can solve the tactics and the guidance. It's wonderful. You want to lean into AI and you want to sort of use it as a tactical guidance tool for team. But what I'm saying is the human, right? Every problem is a human problem in a complex human organizational system. I don't think AIs are going to solve human interaction, right? I think that's where we need people. We need human coaches, human scrum masters. I still think the human is in the equation, but we need to shift from espousing the scrum guide 
to more what? Maybe like communic effective communication or extraordinary facilitation or connecting to the business value streams, right? We need to shift from the simple stuff to the, to the dynamic stuff, I think. And so humans need to step in, build relationships, grow deep and broad skills to help guide organizational human system evolution. That's the place where we can make a difference. So, and again, that's not ignoring AI, but that's, that's embracing it, but also realizing that the human matters. So that's where your future. So there's a shift, there's a shift going on and now's a great time to shift, or at least that's my view and I'm sticking to it right now. So I don't think agile's dying and I don't think human beings are getting eradicated from agile, agile systems quite yet. So enough of that. I'm done. Value, <laughs> coaching value. I, I hope you got some ideas out of that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Bob. I yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, about this whole is agile dead thing, and and I and I think no, we're we're just being called upon to evolve, just like any other position. Scrum masters, agile coaches, it's you know we're just being called upon to to evolve, and and that's where we need to figure out what that looks like for us. But exactly. So uh, first question that I'm seeing, anyways, from Joe. Uh, he wants to know, so he says, I'm hearing a focus on skills and self-promotion, which is great. Um, and part of my values proposition is being the being who can hold the field of transformation. Qualities of presence are valuable. How do you hold the being side of agile in the context of value? I don't know what holding the being side of agile actually means i think either if joe wants to come off mute if you're still here yeah yeah i'll come off mute so i'll give you an example i had a senior leader um in a session i was facilitating for leaders very much like what you were pointing to as a great idea for showing our value bob say to me when she arrived in the session um i feel calm knowing that you're facilitating and that calm isn't a skill. That calm that she's feeling from me is from years and years and years of inner work of being calm in that situation. Correct. So, um, so we talk about mindset and we talk about being a lot and agile. And so what I wanna propose, and I'm very much thinking in um, integral math here, that that upper left quadrant of integral is the most underrated quadrant uh, for many mid-level to more senior level coaches to, to play in as far as what they can do. Once they have the skills, once they're out there at expert level on the wheel, like that's that's where it gets really interesting for me. So I'm just curious, did, was that helpful in kind of hearing more about what I'm pointing to? Yeah, and I, I mean, I'll react quickly. I, I I think there's a there's a balancing act and I'm not trying to have a simple response, but I think there's a balancing act to being, I, I mean, where I'm leaning into now is just showing value, right? So uh, what I mean by that is we have to measure the value independent of integral, independent of wheel, independent of everything. I mean, all of those are all the, independent of our maturity. Right, right now, I think what we miss sometimes is looking our customers in the eye, understanding what they value and then helping them accomplish that or achieve that to, to their measures, to their metrics, using everything that we bring, everything, every part of our being, but we're putting them front and center and then confirming that we're delivering the value to them. Very often I hear coaches, they're frustrated because they're like, they're, you know, leaders are not achieving, they're at, they could be so much more agile. So the goals are the coach isn't listening to the leader's goals. They're list, they're they're their internal goals. They're their agile transformational goals, and those are wonderful. We need to connect to that, but let's put let's put our customers, let's put our let's put our clients, our coaching clients, front and center, and really listen to them. So that's what I mean by that. And whether independent of your experience, independent of the models, that's a message I want to sort of, you know, sort of share with everyone here is client first and use their language don't use our language you really really sort of see into their language 
Uh, and the reason I'm emphasizing it is because there's so much disruption. And, and so I, I want, I don't want folks, I don't, I want us to deliver value to the, to them and then to, to sort of set the stage so we can be transformation artists. If we, if we get terminated, if folks don't see the value, then we're not going to get the opportunities to execute to our visions and to execute to what we're capable of. That was a rambling response. Give me another question. Maybe a simple All right, one. All right. Here's, here's one. I, think we have, I think we have time for one more. For the, this, one, this one comes from Herman. And uh, he said, so as an Agile coach, we need to map our stakeholders. Smiley face. Huh, had to put that in there. Does that make make us the product owner for organizational agility to maximize our value? It, it was map. It was map. The the that uh, context, Herman was mapping, and it was just a, it was just a LinkedIn. It was a revelation from someone who was trying to figure out a woman in an organization with a lot of dynamic challenges was saying, "How do I how do I get promoted?" And one of her ideas was this map my the power structure, map this organization and understand where my advocates are so that I can lean into those. And I actually think from a coaching point of view, depending on your coaching role, and if you're trying to map and emanate value, I think that's a great exercise. You're not trying to, this is not for organizational change. This is not sharing with HR. This is not for sharing dirty laundry. This is for you to understand who, who are my advocates and how am I working with them? And what messages are they saying? And am I building that that advocacy network? It's it's totally selfish, Herman, to some degree. Uh, and and I'd say do that and start with one. You don't have to create some big word cloud. It's just and yet, and the answer might be I have none, <laughs> so I don't have one now. Well, then go go find one or go establish one, and then start building from there. Yeah, thank you. I think it was a very valuable uh, suggestion, and it reminded me of a product owner making a stakeholder map for themselves. Exactly, exactly. It's it's the same concept. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And then you could see yourself also as an agile coach. I'm my own vehicle to deliver value to the organization. Yep. So the other thing uh, she said, real quickly, I know we're out of time, everyone. Understand who's in your way. Understand your detractors. Now, I'm not saying you do anything about, but now you're understanding how can I use my advocates to overcome any of those those obstacles that I might have. So you understand your organizational landscape and start small. It's probably small because you haven't been focusing on it and then start building that advocacy net. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I wish we had more time. There's more questions, but and we always I just love hearing you speak, Bob. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So thank you so much. Um, it was such a joy to have you here with us today, and 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 I we're really appreciative of all the resources you bring with you and um, to, to that you're sharing so freely with us and and your knowledge and your time and and all of that. So thank you so much, and um, and I know you'll be back. So we're gonna see you again. Cool. Thank <laughs> you, ever. Thank you, everyone. And look for the materials. I'm going to share some. Not just the slides, but I have a canvas, a value canvas that I'm uh, I'm actually giving out for the first time. Uh, so so take it with a grain of salt. But but I have some work that you can do on uh, evaluating your uh, value. So look for that in the in the uh, follow up emails. Okay.